Hello and welcome. This is the Mutiny Investing Podcast. This podcast features long-form conversations on topics relating to investing, markets, risk, volatility, and complex systems. So Chris, spring has sprung. Is New York City back? Are you hanging out in the parks and on these, are you getting the sun back? Are you getting, you know, out there and out and about? I mean, is everybody back in the city or is it slowly coming back? Oh, uh, no, I would say that Long Island is more so fully back. Um, just just for everybody watching, I know you guys are <laughs> seeing the Bloomberg screens in the back. This is not a Zoom background. This is the actual, this is our actual conference room. So I apologize. There are no cool Bloomberg screens in the back. Uh, but yeah, as for Long Island, it feels like everything is is back and up and running. Uh, the city, the city as well. I've been to a couple of conferences um, in the city over the last uh, few weeks, but um, you're still getting a couple of people that are more COVID sensitive. And then you're just hearing this news now about the 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 derivation of the new strain coming to the U.S. So who knows? I, I have no clue. And you always, uh, you always tell me you never get nervous, but right now you're fidgeting and clicking your pen. So I'm going to ask you to throw away the pen. <laughs> I, I tried to bring, I tried to bring this for, for an excess mic, but we were having problems ahead of time. Are you, oh, you got a little clip there. You're clicking. I got it. Normally you, you shake your leg and, and, and adjust your jaws. I always bust your balls about. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, speaking of which, like, don't you think that in the future we're just going to be like, um, like Asian countries have been for decades? Like, you'll still have like, I don't know, twenty percent of the population walking around with masks more on a more permanent rolling basis. Or what's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think this is this is one of these things where it's going to take like a cultural shift. It's going to take some time for it to to kind of go away. Um, the safety precautions it seems drilled in people's heads. Uh, you know, I feel like soap and people excessively washing their hand has been a trend over the last, which it should be, right? You should be <laughs> excessively healthy, but, um, and, and cleanly. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think this new way to live is, is here to stay. And then I think last time we were together in New York, it was like, you had to, you know, you show your vaccine passport, like all that stuff now and like in masks and all this, if it is, it has it, I, I think it lifted since then, right? Like everybody's back indoor dining, everything, or how is it set up? Yeah, I think there's still a couple of places that are um, requesting the vaccine card, but not so much with the same sort of force that it was uh, at one point. You know, it was just like you couldn't get anywhere without the card. Uh, so I'd say it's, it's mixed, but we'll see what happens going forward. It's, it just reminded me that when we were meeting up last time in New York, we met up with Darren Johnson and he flew in from Colorado and didn't bring his vaccine card. And you and I are like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, come yeah. on, man. Let's try, uh, we just, definitely try to sneak Darren into it. He was such a nice guy to try to go back to the desk to, to show his card. I was like, man, just come in. Yeah. Um, and then just for context today, we're we're recording this on Tuesday, April 26th, just after the market closed. The S&P was down like probably just a little over 3% today. Um, but I just give that as context is like you and I are texting all the time about, you know, the long volatility and tail risk kind of in this environment. Not only like post pandemic, um, you know, in 2021, even then to Q1 and as we're getting into Q2 here in, in 2022 is, you know, it's been a headwind. For long vol and tail risk strategies, especially with like fixed strike fall. But I think one of the things that you and I always talk about is like, we haven't had a real sell off. I mean, it's starting to seem like that now again, like we're maybe seeing a little bit of liquidity cascade here, or maybe you'll disagree with me there. But you know, everybody's like, we haven't seen a true panic yet or a true sell off where, where tail risk tends to kick in. Um, what do you think? Or maybe you are starting to see that today. What was your what was your take on a little bit of jitters and fragility today? Yeah, you know, so I think that this is a really interesting point because it's one of those things that are not really talked about, especially because, you know, people have an interest in things like tail risk or long volatility, but they don't necessarily fully understand it. So it could be that middle ground where, you you know, you think you're you're in something, but you're not really in what you think you are in. Uh, so like over the last, actually over the couple past couple of months, you haven't really seen that fear transpire in the equity market, more so in, in, in rates ball and FX ball. You've seen that from a cross asset standpoint, but specifically in equity ball, there hasn't been that massive, um, oh, excuse me for cursing, oh shit moment. You know, <laughs> uh, you, you've, you've seen the market slide down and people are like, man, I'm not really hedging too much or, you know, I'm not really too concerned. And to be quite honest, uh, 
you know, I, I don't blame people for, for seeing that. And as you know, you and I have had this discussion, even though we run a vault book, I've been more so personally thinking that this is skewed more towards the bullish side. I've thought that structural flows are going to support equity markets more so. So the Tina effect would play more relevant. I thought the positioning dynamics would play more relevant, these sorts of things. Um, and I still I still do. Uh, and I know that may sound you know crazy to most people, especially because you know you're a vol guy and they're saying, well, don't you think you know the market's coming and gonna crash or whatnot? But as a whole, I would say it's one of those days where you actually really saw fixed strike balls move, you saw skews to get me moving, uh, fixed futures term structure started to get into a slight backwardation. It's it's hard for people to understand when you get that real fear. And I know I have a couple of tweets out, and you and I talk about this uh, a couple of times as well. But when you have that real fear out there, there are dislocations and things that occur that will show you that there is that real sense of fear. Relative value spreads start to break. Um, you know, intermarket spreads start to break. Things don't really make sense. Um, you'll see margin calls from different brokers. You'll see on the retail side, brokers will cut the amount of lending that they'll be able to to extend. They'll cut you from trading certain products. Um, the term structure in, in some of the equity names start looking really wacky and crazy. They look like V's and X's and all these sorts of weird things, right? They don't make any sort of sense at all. But none of that has transpired. And I think this sell-off was more um, anticipated from everybody. And I think for the first time in a while, you're seeing that today. You're seeing a little bit of, oh, man, you know, can the market dip, dip down lower? Uh, because a lot of people were conditioned to buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip, you know, over the last decade and, 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 and so. And not off of the, I would say, narrative that, hey, there is structural flows that support the market, but more so of the winning gambler mentality that, yeah, stocks only go up. Right. That was the the mentality that a lot of people have. So I think it's a it's a combination of all these sorts of things. Me personally, you know, you and I were joking about this, but I think we'll see one of these like end of week rallies where because we're going into end of month and, and you've gotten a lot of equity guys that try to print the book up towards end of month. So who knows? You know, maybe maybe you'll see something like this uh, towards the end of the week. Um, but yeah. Today was one of those days where you got a little bit of a taste of, of what fear looks like, but I don't think we're at that moment yet where you know, you're in a true sense of danger or fear where skew starts rocking. Yeah, it wasn't that you were texting me earlier today, like, yeah, this is just, you know, wait till the last few days of the month here and we're going to get a reversal. And that wasn't your prediction for a reversal, just to be clear. It was more like Gallo's humor of like, we've all been through this before. Like you had like, what was it the third week of January? You had like mid-March. Now we're seeing it at, you know, at the end of April here, where it's all of a sudden you see long volatile risk starting to pay out mid-month. And then it just gets crushed going back into the end of the month. And we're just all on this weird calendar cycle of showing our numbers the first of the month. So it's just like, it looks like vol's not doing anything, but in the, interim on the monthly basis or even in interday is doing a lot of stuff we're just not seeing it on the monthly prints so yeah. that's what we're kind of joking about yeah exactly right and, and full disclosure it's, which is not a, not a surprise or anything but you guys allocate to us you know so we have these talks as investor to to manage your meetings and a lot of times i'm like hey man the book was really up big today but then the end of month print comes in and the book is you know flat to down or, or, or things of that nature and that's because that's how equity vol has been um, recently over the last you know few months or so. Uh, it's been that big spike up intraday on some sort of a move, and then the rebound comes. You get this big vol crush, and you know towards the end of the month, it's the, the buy the dip mentality. So it, yeah, it is just this this type of manager to investor humor. But like, like you're saying with buy the dip or BTFD, I just wonder like. You know, we've had a decade plus where that's just been incentivized and everybody just gets lulled into that false sense of security. So we see that go on for a while. And so, like you said, maybe people are still in that mindset of it's still by the dip. And that works until it doesn't work, right? And then all hell breaks loose. And I wonder, you love good old uh, trader aphorisms too. And there's always the one that like a hedge, mar a hedge market doesn't crash. And so like, is that what we've seen kind of in the long ball terrorist space? Like, because people are actually putting on that put protection, fixed strike ball has some skew to it. So we're not really seeing movement there. Um, do you think people have to think that like in January, stuff like that, it needs to have, go through a few cycles where it doesn't play out before people take that hedge off and then we could see, really see market movements? Like, I'm curious how you would think about that. Yeah, you know, that's a great, great, great point. Um, and 
again, you know, just having the conversation that we have from investor to manager, November, towards that late November, we had a really nice move in SKU. So SKU started to pick up, books started to move pretty nicely. Um, and then when you had the move in January, obviously that move in November gave it back. But the move that you saw in January, people were already kind of pre-hedged at that level. So when you got back, when S&P got back directly to that level, it was like, you know, everybody looked across the, the street and was like, well, we don't need to hedge because we just literally re-hedged that, that fresh vega a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think we, you saw the relative weakness involved for that January move. So the relative weakness involved for that uh, February move, you know, you've been seeing just straight out relative weakness involved. And it's been that slow grind down. But one interesting thing about this new uh, little pull in the market is that a lot of the positioning from what we track has showed that not too many people have been actively buying vol into this. So, um, and, you know, shout out to the guys from Squeeze Metrics. They had this this post on Twitter and, and I retweeted it, um, you know, to not talk too much about how kind of how we track it. But they looked at it and said a lot of the put positioning has been leaned more towards hoping to sell. And we look at it that way as well. You know, we kind of saw some of the positioning and other factors that we track were saying that, yeah, you know, it didn't really seem that people were aggressively hedging downside. So that seems to be confirmed now because when the market is sliding down, you're getting that excess relative strength in fall now, I guess. Um, but if the market slides down a couple more percent, I think you can get that real big move in fall just off of the fact that the positioning is a little bit off size. And those are the sorts of things that you you want as a vol manager because you want that excess performance and skew. You want when you buy those puts extremely cheap and the market gets in that 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 sense of fear, you make money. You know, a lot of people who don't trade vol don't understand, specifically if you're trading skew, that you don't need the options to be in the money or anything of that sort. You just need the repricing. Right. right. So repricing so if, a risk. Yeah. Exactly. If you get the repricing of risk, that is enough to have a vol book return 100 percent, 200 percent because of the exposure that you have. And you're not going to get the repricing unless you get the sense of fear. So when you get that fear, that's when you get the repricing. And as vol traders, that's like you know, jackpot. Um, but if you're not getting that that repricing in, in an IV, it's just, you know, it could be a boring game in a, in a, in a sense. But as part of that, like, um, you know, the buy the dip mentality or that a hedge market doesn't crash. The other one I always hear all the time is uh, the Fed put. Uh, but you always talk about like inflection points and chaos theory and everything is like, yeah, I, I go, I don't, I don't disagree. Like the majority of the time a hedge market doesn't crash. The majority of the time the Fed puts worked. But what happens when it doesn't? Right. You, like you said, as soon as we start getting up into those like Fed put zones or those, um, you know, where all the hedging is, it's like, it starts to get people start to get a little worried, a little fearful. But if we break through those, that's like beyond fear. That's like sheer outright panic, and the market just hits an air pocket. Is that like is that like a way of looking at it too? We just haven't seen it yet. It doesn't mean it won't happen. But if it breaks through there, it doesn't mean it will happen either. But that's where you have just sheer absolute panic. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's a byproduct of the fact that we've been so polarized to see equity markets go up and make all time highs every other week over the last you know, decade or so. Um, you know, even even recently, more so over the last two years since since the COVID bottom, people are just waking up all time highs, all time highs, all time highs. So we kind of forget how markets work and they function. And a five percent pullback in the S and P off of all time highs, I would argue that's well within the realm of a healthy market or a, a healthy market correction. That's not a quote unquote tail risk event. But one hundred percent, if you get into those pockets where positioning is off sides and people are trapped and you know you get that that quote unquote oh shit moment it could lead to that big repricing of risk where vol starts to really outperform and, and really blow up and the derivatives on some of the vol stuff that you're carrying start to get repriced at those those massive levels right and then you were talking about um you know, we referenced what is your mandate, right? Like your institutional mandate. And I think a lot of retail 
traders, investors might miss this when they, we start talking about um, institutional heist, hedge funds and everything is like the idea is you you run a very niche strategy. And that's what exactly what allocators like I look and myself look for. And the idea is like, I need you to do very specific thing, right? Like, and you're an equity vol space um, and then specifically use a lot of like dispersion trades and, and single name equities. But like, you know, we're seeing a lot of explosion in rates vol or, or fixed income vol or, you know, you could be searching for cheap convexity around the world, but that's not your mandate. Right. So everybody would think you'd be able to go anywhere, do anything. You should be able to make money all the time. But that's not what you do. You have a very narrow niche or, or constraint on what you can trade. But part of that, like I said, is the single names. And so uh, I'm going to jump right in is like you were trying to call on Twitter, uh, like a lot of people that that Elon was going to make his move on 420. It didn't quite happen <laughs> on 420, but like his bid was 5420. And so I'll even start with like, is he 12 years old? Like, I just don't understand these kind of like games. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I I don't know either. I think that's a uh, it's just a byproduct of the times that we live in. You know, one one thing that I got this paper coming out. I'm really excited to to have you and uh, the rest of the guys read the paper as well because I think you guys will enjoy it. Because one part about it is we talk about the psychological change and how the investor base's mentality has changed over the last five years and the new buying power of the millennials are attributing to more variance in market prices, right? So it's just like a psychological thing that the new players now who are inheriting the, the majority of the buying powers will now impact, you know, their decisions will impact the way how asset prices are, are moving, which in turn should mean more variance. And you see things like that expressed with some of the leaders that are in the market or in the world now with like Elon Musk, which is a guy who is um, world renowned, uh, a very, prestigious role in a huge company uh, have jokes like that or hey yeah you know 420 and, and you know I'm, I'm behind Dogecoin and just more playful and 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 I think the um, the message that that sends to other people who may not be in that position of power is is not as good because what it could mean is well here's a guy who has 300,000 worth of savings and he's yellowing one third of that in some sort of alternative coin or, or maybe only the whole thing on some sort of alternative coin because it's cool or fun. And it, it, it's all fun and games until somebody loses, you know, their savings, which is a whole different ball game. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think Elon is, is kind of a crazy dude. But part of it is like, I think another one was like, take Twitter and remove the W. Ha ha ha. Like, are you kidding? Me? Like, there's like, I know you're saying like, it's, it may be a generational thing, but like, I know you're younger than I am, but like, I don't, and Elon's older than me, but it's just like, those are kind of like a 12 year old or 13 year old's joke. That's what I'm like really getting at is like, this is kind of just infantile in general. Or do you think that's just a shift in market sentiment? And he's trying to appeal to a younger generation that may not have maybe the reverence for running. A, I'm not even saying it's reverent. Like these are just bad jokes. It's, it, I'm just saying it's like lame. And you and I wouldn't hang out with that person. I don't want to speak for you. Sorry. I just, I wouldn't hang out with that person. Yeah. Jason's too cool for Elon. I, I would <laughs> hang out with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or just like I, you know but the, to your point i'd probably hang out with elon but just anybody that makes those jokes i'd be like i'm out like this is ridiculous uh but part of that i wonder be are you concerned at all because like you made a name for yourself on twitter so are you concerned like or you think it's a necessarily good or bad thing i mean we're a long way off for him taking over twitter or even how he'd run it or even his hands-on operation at all but like i'm, I'm curious of what you think about because you use Twitter as your, like your primary, you know, marketing advertising vehicle. Like, how do you think about it? No, to be honest with you, I don't really, don't really uh, care too much. I've actually, st I actually been tweeting way less, um, as I'm sure you know, as the, the business side of things just pick up, right? You just don't even have the capacity to, to, to be actively tweeting at times. Um, so no, I don't really view it as like a negative thing in a sense that he's coming on. Um, and to be honest with you, if Twitter went under, I just think people would just gravitate over towards another platform. Um, you, know, you know, you always get these trends. Back when I was in um, middle school, it was MySpace, you know, and went to Facebook. And then obviously, you know, these things grow and, and take over. But yeah, the, the finance community has a heavy presence on Twitter. I don't think that that's going anywhere. But if it does, it's just like ecosystem. All the same guys would probably end up on some other platform and then just you know, talk stuff there. Are you going to, are you going to beat me to TikTok? Cause yeah, I think you'd, you'd dominate. So I, I want to make sure I get there first. So are you, do you have a TikTok handle yet? No, I actually do not have TikTok. I don't think I'll be doing, to be honest, man, I, I don't think I'll be doing much more social media. Social media could be 
like a, a pain as well, as, as I'm sure you know, for compliance reasons, it could be a, a big pain. There's just so much things that you can, can't talk about. Um, and then you get some people on there who are just weird people that like try to stalk you and things of that sort. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, man, it's a, it's a weird yeah. place. But then I, on the flip side, on the other side, you, you have a, a lot of nice people that you meet too, a lot of intelligent people that you come across with good ideas. So net and net, it's a positive. But I think if Twitter dies out, you know, I, I may die out as a social media person. So. <laughs> Well, you'd be surprised. Like, uh, my girlfriend's been crushing on TikTok, and everybody thinks TikTok's still like teenagers dancing, and it's so far moved beyond that. Like, the average age now is like 31 on TikTok. So it's it's just like, every, like you were referencing MySpace earlier. It's like everything moves up the age demographics. So it's amazing how much TikTok started to move up there. And a lot of people think it's more positive than Twitter in general, or especially more positive than Instagram of just showing this idealized, stylized life. But I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out. It's hard to, to put uh, financial content into TikTok, but maybe I'm just uh, not as creative. Um, but part of that, what I've been, I've been like wrestling with, like you just referenced is we have one, I don't think a lot of people realize the burden we have on the compliance level of running social media, like Twitter and everything. And like you said, Twitter is the number one spot for FinTwit guys, but like or guys and girls, but like part of it is that, like you said, a lot of people built up their reputation there in the, in the Twitter space. And then if they then open their fund or, or, and they get inflows into their funds because of the presence they built on Twitter, and then later on, compliance and just running the business gets so heavy that, like you said, you start pulling back from Twitter. A bit, a bit of it feels a little bit disingenuous. But also, is it disingenuous? Like, do you really owe anybody anything? Like, everybody feels like a lot of times I've seen a lot of other people's DMs, and people think like you owe them something, even though it's a free platform. But I'm just like, how do you think about like that that pullback? Like, do you feel like the pull of like I, even though I'm running a a, a, bit, a larger fund now, I still should be on Twitter more? Or? Yeah, you know, I see a couple sides to it because there's a lot of kids there that I think about that were in the same position as I was when I was trying to get my first job on Wall Street and going through the processes that they went through and, and being able to talk with, with other traders. And I enjoy that that communication. I enjoy communicating with you know, the guy who has a couple bucks in his his family account and he's just, you know, looking at a new way to think about things, right? Not investment advice, but here's how you should think about risk, right? You don't you don't want to be risking 20% on one trade or a thesis that you read on Zero Hedge or, you know, so I, I enjoy helping and engaging with people like that. Um, so I, I do feel bad in a sense that I can't fully, and man, my message requests are just like, I'm not even exaggerating. It's like thousands, like thousands. I've seen them. I've seen them. It's like crazy, crazy. Not even my messages, the just messages requests. So if anybody, you know, tried to reach out to me, guys, and you know, you don't hear from me, I apologize because I really don't mean to miss those messages. But it's just there's no way for me to even keep up with them. Um, you know, so I, I do feel bad that I can't openly be out there like that. But at the same time, uh, you know, if, if our attorneys say, "Look, you can't be saying that," or you know, this and that. <laughs> my hands are kind of tied there, you know? Um, so well, like, it, it's, it's, it's really hard because you're one person and I've seen the amount of message requests you get is insane to me. But then part of it too is like, there's a lot of good, like you said, you can help out um, young guys on the come up, like give them like just a little pointer, not that you give them advice, just kind of pointers here or there, or we get, you know, great DMS with other managers or even on Twitter, somebody, you can find an expert in any space and they can really school you on Twitter of like, actually, what are the details of that space that you would never even think of? But then at the same time, you know, you can't taste the sweet without the bitter. And the bitter side is like, you got people attacking like the cut of your fade, you know, that, you know, you need a haircut. Like you just never like, it's just an absolute like chaos. So it's it's just hard to deal with on a just volume basis. Man, I heard like some people are, are just really crazy with some of the claims too. like, like somebody with <laughs> one, one person, one person even said that he's like, you know, the Bloomberg's that he has is fake. Like, dude, you could just pull up, but you could just click on <laughs> Bloomberg IB. You'll see my name pop up. It's registered under my name. Like, you know what I mean? Like, some of the things, man, that, that you have with some people on there, yeah, it could be, it could be a little, little, little ridiculous. You know, Chris Cole is a mutual friend of ours. Yeah, that's a dude who had to go through the the ringer because so many people just, you know, Chris Cole had a lot of good stuff that he put out on Twitter, and you know, he would talk about things and. It got to a point where this guy was just like, yeah, screw it. You know, like, I don't want to be engaged in Twitter anymore. And, you know, I, I feel like that's a disservice because so many pe people yeah. told this this guy who's a very intelligent dude who had a lot of good thoughts to put out. 
he trolled him to a point you you know he, he just said screw it I'll just be to myself um so yeah it's a it's a balancing act you know with with silly little things like that well, and like you said, it's like uh, if you already have an established fund, it's not really a net benefit to be on Twitter. Like we would want Chris to be on there, but I'm always like telling Chris, I'm like, why would you be on there? Like there's kind of, there's not really a, a point for him to be on there. Do you think also like um, because of your age, you think like you're easily more easily able to handle Twitter? Like I think about like me, like I'm even, you know, I like to think I have thick skin, but I'm also a sensitive artist underneath. And it's like, it's, it's brutal on a daily basis, but do you feel like you just grew up with just that chaos? And so it's easier for you to like have thicker skin or just shrug it off when like everybody goes on the attacker? Man, trust me. I, I think I've went through so, so much more than that in my life <laughs> that like the little, those little type of things just don't, they don't really affect me, especially when, some of it is just like, damn, bro, you didn't even do your due diligence well enough to like, you know, like the the, the Bloomberg thing, right? Oh, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a yeah. Bloomberg. You know what I mean? Like, it's like pointless claims and stuff like that um, that people will have uh, on Twitter. So no, none of those things, you know, really, really stage me or affect me. A couple of times I've actually laughed at, laughed at some yeah. of the things people have said. Um, but yeah. It's, uh, but like you said, if you know yourself and it's so like outside the realm, it's just like it's funny. And you're like, actually, that's pretty funny. That's a good joke because you know yourself. But I'm wondering, like, sometimes there might be something that like just just touches off that part that you like that is maybe a uh, insecurity you have. So maybe then that night you're out there rolling with your jujitsu partners and they're tapping and you might be pulling a little too hard or it's like it's, it's affecting on that subconscious level. Yeah, no, man. Unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately, I have not experienced uh, any of that to a point where it really like upsets me or anything like that. Um, I'd say for the most part, you know, most of the people on Twitter are really kind and have good positive things. It, it, it upsets me when I see people just trolling people for, for no reason. It can be a little embarrassing, too, because I see like there's a couple of guys who are you know way older than I am. And I know they like stalk my page to try to come and troll me. I'm like, dude, like you're an old guy, go hang out with your wife, you know, go hang out with, with your kids, you know, just come in here trying to antagonize, you know, a younger dude. Like I can't see myself in that situation where I'm an older dude trying to antagonize some younger guy, or even, you know, sometimes people antagonize other people in there. And I'm like, hey, you shouldn't talk to this person like that. That's somebody's grandfather. That's somebody's you know, husband. That's somebody's wife. So I, I hate when I see the, the, some of the trolling and the disrespect that that goes on on Twitter to that extent. As like I said, for me, I don't, there's not much that people could do to really you know upset me on that front. But like when I see it for other people, I kind of feel bad because I'm just like, Here's, this is somebody's you know grandfather. You're gonna try to shit on, <laughs> on on you know what I mean? Like come on, man! Like there's a guy break like. <laughs> It reminds me, like, I think I heard Grant Williams say something like, talk about Biden. He's like, he just reminds me, of, I just want to give him a hug. Like, poor guy, like, I'll just give him a hug and I'll show him off stage, not yell at him and think he's the evil. Uh, but you say that, but now I'm, that makes me, next time I'm in town, I'm going to survey your training partners to see, like, what days you end up taking out, you know, a little bit of aggression on them. Maybe it's, you know, up days, down days, or what's going on in your Twitter space. But uh, part of that, though, like, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Like, maybe that's why you're able to shrug it off so well, because you train so hard. Like, let's talk about like MMA, weightlifting. Is that how, like, if you don't, if you go a few days without training, do you find yourself a little more on edge? Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I definitely need to, to train at least, at least once a week with, with the MMA stuff. I think that it's, it's a, uh, and other jujitsu guys can attest to this, but it's that weird, like, sense that it brings you in where nothing matters at that point. All right. And it doesn't matter well, how much money did we make? It doesn't matter uh, what school you went to. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter what's going on in your 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 social life with with uh, you know your family. None of that matters. The only thing that matters, and your brain just locks all of those things out, is just handling this guy in front of me who is competitively trying to kill me, right? Not not obviously, right, but, but comp- competitively trying to to harm me. And I think this puts you in this weird zone, which I never get because. Throughout the day, we're trading, we're managing risks, we're trying to see new trade opportunities, we're trying to optimize trading strategies, we're getting back to investors, uh, we're talking to our attorneys, we're talking to our, our 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 own families, right? With things like, hey, can you get can you bring home some fish tonight or some bread tonight or something like that? You're you're juggling all these sorts of things, but when you get into that environment, it's a complete lock off for for an hour and a half straight. I can't even fathom that because. I'm just thinking about putting my hand here or moving my hand there or 
positioning myself or what this guy's next move is going to be. Um, and when you come out of there, you feel so relaxed and, and mentally at ease. It's almost like a big reset. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think that's one of those things. And, and jujitsu is very, very in line with with trading and markets, you know, with with humbling yourself, being open to having no ego and accepting losses. You know, you and I have been talking about, well, mentally, how does a trader how does a trader handle a drawdown period? Right. If you're a newer trader, you you'll probably struggle with those sorts of things. But if you've been trading for eight you know, 10 years or so to you, you've, you've experienced drawdown periods. It's just the nature of it. And you have no ego towards it because you understand the system works. The edge works. It's just a product. It's just a part of the edge, not working. I manage risk and I move accordingly and I have no ego. I have no ego. I have no opinion. I do what markets say. And it's the same thing with, with jujitsu. I have no ego. I'm going to follow the move accordingly. I'm going to be accepting if, if I'm losing, I think these all these these life lessons come in, into one, and this is why I'm becoming like a hippie in a sense because <laughs> jujitsu and trading. But but jujitsu practitioners and guys who have who have done the sport and 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 are traders, they can attest for that as well. Yeah, shout out to Sal. One day, you know, Sal and I are slowly turning into a hippie with all of our our crazy <laughs> hippie ideas around the fringes. Um, it reminded me of like years ago, I was having coffee with like Ben Eifert. And Chris Abdul Masia and my and my partner Taylor and we were talking about um uh you know we're, I was talking to Ben about kids and I was like you know I don't I don't have kids but I don't know how to shut my brain down right from business like I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about portfolios I wake up in the morning thinking about portfolios I go to bed thinking about portfolios I have to unfortunately listen to podcasts just to try to fall asleep all I do is work like twenty four seven that's all I think about. And, and I was like, I don't know how to shut my brain down. But then it made me think, like you just said with jujitsu, maybe I need to get back into BJJ or something. And, and cause of like, you can't think about any, anything else. And it makes me think of even, I don't know why it's just long ball guys. I'm sure it's, it's across a lot of businesses. Maybe long ball guys are better at figuring it out, but like you have Ben Eifert's, you know, cyclist that's climbing those hills of the South Bay where it's so painful. You can't think about anything else except for your lactic acid threshold. You've got Veneer Bonsali's flying helicopters. Chris Cole's a rock climber. Uh, Bastian Balesta is an ice climber in Switzerland. You're doing, you know, MMA training. So yeah, maybe that's it. You need something that's like so harrowing where you're probably the smartest because you have like constrained, like uh, death is on the line, but it's more of like a pseudo uh, you know, survival ship bias. And maybe that's, maybe that's the smartest one. Although have you been to clients meetings with like a, a, a black eye or a little cauliflower ear or like a, a wonky arm or anything like that yet? So, so obviously you know about the jaw thing. If you guys see yeah. me ever clicking my jaw, that's because like I got hit a while back and my jaw is just like weird from that's from boxing actually. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of times I had like a little bit of a, a, a black mark, like right here. I'm trying to think, there was recently something too that had me a, a little bit messed up, but it, it's it's nothing too extreme. Um, I always make sure I wear a mouth guard. That's like the biggest. It's like my biggest fear is losing my teeth. So if I, <laughs> if I go with like a knocked out teeth, oh man, investors would not like that. Um, at prior firms where I worked at too, and I did this, it's not that they had a problem with it, but you could tell like some of the older MDs were always like, you know, you think you should be doing that? You know, let's go play golf or something like that. Um, well, I mean, golf would be the, I would actually just just as worse because it was to me. It's not about your your pretty face getting injured. To me, it's more like if you really tweak your lower back, like how badly is that going to affect your trading, right? Like because subconsciously you're worried about your back. But the same thing with golf. Somebody could tweak their back. You know, it's like that's what I'd be more worried about. Is like if you're in constant pain and you're trying to trade your book, and I'm your allocator. It's like, man, how much is this affecting his trading abilities? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's actually a good way to look at it as well. And you couldn't use the Soros model of, of your back pain allegedly teaches you how to trade and what positions to get out of because you'd just be in permanent back pain. So that wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> the other thing you referenced, though, you said, you know, as, as you're in this trading business, you have to learn to be very zen about trading and you have to be very agnostic about drawdowns, you know, noise in markets up, down, et cetera, because, you know, you have a long term process and you know what you're doing. And that's one thing when, you know, you're. You have your own book, uh, whether you're trading your personal capital, which is sometimes hard for people to do, or you're an institution and you're trading internal capital at the bank like you used to do. I'm just curious now, that's one thing to say and you're trading your book, but now you have clients. 
and clients are constantly calling you and sometimes asking for updates or not happy with performance or whatever, but you know it's part of the process and it's part of the longer term outlook you have. So now you have this third order effect though of clients affecting the way you're maybe thinking about your, you have to make sure it doesn't affect your trading process, but it can be brutal at times to get those calls like during and around trading hours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's one of those things where, um, so just to open up the kimono and like I said, you know, we're two guys talking, we could, we could talk about this. Um, last year was a year that my partners and I, and and actually this is, this is a true fact. You guys could, I'm not sure if you even know this, but you could go back and you could check the, the numbers, but we haven't charged any clients, any sort of management fee. We have not charged clients any management fee. Last year, our business was fully supported by our training. That's a point blank period. We made money, and this is not in the vol, the, the vol side of the business. This is you know, private fund. We made money in that side of the business to support the business as a whole. So we understand as traders how to go out there. How do you make money? Right. But throughout the time, you will go through periods of drawdowns. Right. So last year was a year that we had. You know, a solid year. Our trading on that stand front, um, standpoint this year, more so slightly down to flattish. Psychologically, I think with other traders who are more who are inexperienced in that front, they could be in a panic because they're like, "Oh man, you know, I'm drawing down. You know, we just we're we're getting this all launch now. You know, we have more assets under management." But it's one of those things that you just have to reassure yourself that, listen, I've been here a million times. I know the process. This happened in 2013. This happened in 2015. This happened in 2017. It's just the process. And you're right. If you have investors who are non-understanding towards that, like an investor who may say, I'm just throwing out numbers here, right? Imagine imagine a guy, you have a guy who's trading bad for seven, eight months. That's a small time frame. You, If you look at a real long track record in a person, you'll see sometimes guys go year and a half, two years where they're trading poorly. And then well, they might not be trading back. poorly. Their, their strategy might be out of vogue too. It might not even be just, they're still trading. Well, it's just not a target rich environment for them. Correct. Correct. Right. There's, there's, there's all these sorts of things that play in. So when an investor is making a decision as to how they should invest or who they should invest with, you really got to be behind the manager themselves as well and understanding, okay, this is the thesis. This is what they're foreseeing because uh, three months of, of checking a, uh, a track record, six months of checking a track record, that may not be fully representative of how the trader is, how the manager is. Um, so with us, we never let that, you know, be a problem. Thankfully for us, you know, we don't have bad investors. We think all of our investor base is, is really solid. They understand. They're investors that understand, hey, the market has not, um, you know, crashed you, if you're running some sort of long vol or, you know, vol arc type of profile, most likely you're going to have some sort of negative carry. You know, it's understanding if you have, you know, you're down 20 percent or something like that. Right. That's where it's like, whoa, you know, man, you're not doing your job. But, you know, if you're having that slight lead, that's all within the realm of the understanding. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship with the manager understanding you know, what the client's expectations are. And then also the client understanding what they're investing in with the managers. And like I said, thankfully we have not had any problems on, on that front with managers complaining or, or anything like that, because I think the investors that we bring in are more on the sophisticated side and they understand that, Hey, if the S and P is up 21%, you guys are probably going to be down to flat or most likely down. Right. We keep that in a, in a safe boundary, more along the lines of down five, down seven, and not down thirty. That's that's fair play. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's one of those things where it could be tough for a manager if you're if you're getting that prompt from the investors. But as you always say, you know, you, we have to fire the investor, right? You have the manager has to fire the investor because it's true. It could be it could be tough to operate like that, and the manager has to have that ability to operate. And the investor needs to trust the manager in that process to say, listen, I'm with you guys for this reason, and I'm going to let you operate in that in that functionality. But but it becomes a point where, you know, you know, a red flag when you see one. If a guy is swinging down plus minus 30 percent in a product that's not designed that way, then, of course, you should be inquisitive towards it. But 
yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point that you brought up, and it's one of those things that gets overlooked quite often. Yeah, like you said, I always reference you want to fire your clients. And what I mean by that is like, you don't, uh, you don't want hot money, right? You want to find somebody that understands what you do, takes the time to understand to you. They're philosophically aligned to what you do. So hopefully they can stick around for the long term and you both have a symbiotic good relationship. But everybody thinks they just want money. They just want AUM. So they'll take all money. And then they're surprised when they have these inflows and outflows and they have problem clients. And it's like, yeah, you didn't take the time to educate your client. And and to actually like to vet your client, you know, everybody thinks they're there just to vet you as a manager, but you should be vetting them as a client to make sure it's a good client for you. It reminds me of, I, I was talking to uh, Jerry Hayworth about, uh, you know, sometimes if they, if they roll out a new fund, you know, capital allocators think they're very, you know, smart and sophisticated and everything. But we always talk about, they're actually, uh, they're actually like, you know, just trend followers or performance chasers too, because like Jerry's been around since like the eighties and nineties, right? Like has a reputation. If he's rolling on a new fund and puts the philosophy together and he teaches you about the entire philosophy, capital allocators will then go, well, we'll wait two years to see how your performance is. And it's like, how does that make any sense? Like, like performance up, down, it's more based on the market, not the philosophy. It's like you either believe in what he does and it makes sense to you as far as an allocation of your book, or you're just a performance chaser anyway. And so I'm sure you get it all the time. It's like, you guys are a new fund. We'll see how you do for the first two to three years. Yeah. Yeah. That could be, it could be a little bit of a slap in the face too, when you get that, because it's like, okay, so has everything that I've done in my career as a trader prior to that, like not matter at all. Uh, you know, the being a part of a team at BMO, uh, being part of a small hedge fund and trading prop, then you know, learning under a guy who is like pretty renowned at, at the CBOE, like none of that matters. It's just, oh, yeah, well, the next the next four years matter. And then after, you, you know, you guys have a four year track record, that's what matters. I think those are one of those things where the older generation is more designed to, to think that way. But as the millennials inherit that type of control, you're, you will see that less and less because people will understand. Like, I mean, think of the crypto thing. You had a lot of smart yeah. guys that were, you know, going out there and, and taking their shot in crypto. You know, there, I, the couple of Jane Street guys, right, guys that ran books over at a, at a real quant ball shop. Um, you're going to tell me that you want to wait to see, you know, a two, three year track record for, for individuals like that. You know, so these sorts of things don't really make sense. I agree with your way of thinking about it as well is, well, do you believe in the process? Do you believe in in the thesis? And if so, you know, that's more so that matters because, you know, we could talk about the time ensemble, you know, not matching the average ensemble all day long, right? And toss around the ergodicity and, and go down that path. But it's really true. It's like, well, you're with the manager for seven months, what does that really show? You know, um, because you could exit with that manager at month eight and they could return 700% in the next two years. Um, so, yeah, it's important for the, for the investor to believe in the thesis and the process more so than, you know, just, well, you know, are you guys up immediately, you know, if you're running absolute return and things of that sort. And if I'm going to be sympathetic or steel man allocators, I mean, it's, obviously, uh, it's really important to do a deep dive due diligence, and hopefully they're doing that. But what I've found a lot of times is it's it's a performative due diligence of checking box, and they have all of these parameters that maybe that person in the seat wasn't part of, right? They're, they just came into like an endowment or pension, and but a lot of them have these little things like in business for two years, you know, running more than $100 million. Are you going to be, is your allocation size going to be more than 5% of the fund? All of these things do not mean anything for due diligence, but these are kind of the check boxes that we see in the industry. Like, and like you said, hopefully that's changing and people actually take the time to educate themselves on what the manager is doing versus just checking the box, you know, to make sure that that's their performative, uh, like due diligence, you know, part of, and then what you said about crypto, I find it fascinating. I just couldn't help, but the last time I was in New York, the takeaway I had from a lot of our conversations like you, Darren and Ewan was like a lot of time edge is something that can't be explained or expressed. Like by the time you can run a a beautiful back test to it. And by the time it's out in academic papers, the edge has already been arbed away. And so it's, it's really odd to explain, like, especially like we're crypto is a good example of that is like, you know, if you have a trading strategy, you think is going to work and you can explain it well, and people will will show me a five-year back test. Like that's just not going to happen. And so I just wonder like how many of that, like, will having those concepts will preclude you from finding edge. Like I remember talking to you and about like CTAs in the 1970s, right? Those guys were swashbuckling cowboys back then. And everybody thought they were lunatics and even using like, um, 
you know, moving average crossovers. That was like voodoo and the new stuff. And everybody's like, show me a back test. And they're like, we can't produce one. And yet they performed amazingly well. And then you have all the pay- academic papers and everybody comes behind into the back test. And by that time, the returns have come down because they're get- essentially getting arbed away to a, like a normalized return. I'm curious, like, how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's it right there. You nailed it. You know, it doesn't even <laughs> need to go deeper. I'm done. And I'm done. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's really the truth. You know, one thing on the prop side that you learn that I was extremely grateful for, for getting this in my career is all these small capacity constraint strategies that have edges. The, the things that, and obviously I don't want to come out and fully talk about it, but you and I have spoken about some of these things on, on the side. Some of these strategies are really good strategies that a lot of people overlook. One, because they don't care to partake in them, or two, they don't have the, you know, it doesn't make sense if you're running a, a multi billion dollar fund, you're not going to be in something that's going to be, you know, dry liquidity on something you're, you're running intraday where you're just going to, you know, kind of struggle to, to, to get in and out. Whereas if you're a $250 million fund, well, I could partake in that all day. And if I could make, you know, two to three to five basis points a day running these capacity constraint, you know, true, true type strategies, these are really good edges that lie in the market out there. And a lot of times people are, are overlooking them or step over them. And um, yeah, it, the market will always have that. Every market will always have these type of capacity constraints, really core cool strategies. And and to be honest, these are the best type of strategies that investors, like if they understood the full spectrum of it, will want because you're doing it that is zero beta, uncorrelated to S&P completely. And it's a, it's a true return stream. So I agree with that. You, you shouldn't always go off of the back test or try to uh, pull too much from the back test because at that point in time, it, it's late. And, and if you have been trading markets long enough, there are some things that conceptually make sense. Um, you know, my, my partner, Will, he sometimes will talk about something conceptually. Well, did you see this because of this, this, and this? And does this make sense? And just from trading, we understood... We, well, we understand that, yeah, that could work. Going through the back test process and collecting the data and going through that could literally take a whole year. Do we want to wait a whole year to roll this strategy out? Or could we say, okay, risk one basis point on this and let's start to track this, right? And then let's start to size accordingly if the trade it makes sense, right? Well, so we'll put it through a phase one, phase two, phase three production test and we'll go about it in that in that manner as opposed to saying well let's go through a full quant back test where we're going to say let's collect the data let's go through stage one testing and yeah some of the things don't don't really make sense so i'm in agreement with that but you guys you guys have put in the reps so you kind of almost see it subconsciously because i know you even will tweet about it all the time is like reading the tape right like if you guys are constantly watching the markets and you're constantly in that seat just staring at your bloomberg screen is you guys will see anomalies in the trade you do and that will remind you of something from five six seven ten years ago and you go this is an opportunity here that we can take advantage of before this window closes and there's no way of proving it you just know from putting in the reps and so yeah. that's one way like there's so there's multiple ways right like you, you have whole trading strategies that may not have a back test. You have anomalies that pop up from reading the tape. Sorry, you were going to say something before I go on to the third one. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You're good. But this one is uh, maybe maybe further afield. But I think about it, I was reminded of uh, the philosophy of ick. Uh, you probably never heard this one. But <laughs> forgive me for a second. I'm laughing because I know where, I'm, where my head's going on this. There's philosophers that talk about things that like, they, they literally call it the philosophy of ick, like ick being gross, right? The idea of like, if you if you had like sex with a raw chicken and then you cleaned it and cooked it and ate it, is there anything wrong with that, or is it just a philosophy of ick? Or like if you had uh, sex with one of your relatives, but like you both were on birth control, is that wrong, or is that just a philosophy of ick? Um, I know I'm taking you to an uncomfortable place, but the reason I said that is to get back to like if somebody like you is trading dispersion trades and you are trading some single name equities, it's interesting how. An institutional dispersion trader might never touch meme stocks because it's a philosophy of ick. They won't be able to explain that to their allocators, and they think they're so sophisticated that they're too good to touch those stocks. So it's almost like a philosophy of ick where you're just like agnostic and are like, I'll trade what makes money. And so you get to opportunities that people would be surprised that institutional traders won't touch. For sure. You know, this is why I enjoy talking <laughs> with some of the guys that are like the the good retail traders, like Darren Johnson. Um, Tyler Kling, uh, you know, these guys, these guys bring me back to that more so older space because on the institutional side, 
you get bogged down with this whole quant process as well. And sometimes that could convolute your thoughts to realize that there's a lot of easy money that's out there in certain areas that have these dislocations, but nobody wants to pick it up. So the pure academic type will lift their nose at these type of strategies and these type of opportunities out there. But it's like, yeah, why wouldn't I take that? Why wouldn't I you know, put that trade on? Why wouldn't I think about this process? Um, you know, so it, it's a, it's an ego thing too. This goes back to the jujitsu thing and, and the trader thing. Um, some, me personally, some of the best traders that I've known have been guys that are ex prop guys that have built up a huge bank role that are now kind of just retail. Um, you know, some of the guys on the sell side and you know, I'm sure sell side guys will admit this too. They suck as traders because it's not, you know, they don't have a true, true edge. They don't think about markets in that manner. Um, you know, and sometimes buy side guys too can be obviously really good traders, but some of them can be more so just data driven and structured focus. So not pure alpha, just I'm in the right place at the right time, running the right trade structure. Um, you know, long only momentum guys over the last decade or so. Cool. Those guys have performed ex- insanely well. Um, is that trader skill or is that a byproduct of the fact that? You know, it's quarter correlated to, to, to equities drifting up. These are all these sorts of things that, that you could think of. Um, so I think the guys that were ex-prop guys that turned retail guys understand how to think about unconventional edges and make that process a way to, to have a living. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's really it, – it's one of those things where I'm more surprised to – that people don't think in that manner about being the guy at the poker table in AC at 1 a.m. Like, why wouldn't you want to just make easy money? This is a, there was a trader like way back in the day. This was like 2013. He had this like really stupid saying, um, but it, it stuck with me. He was just like, why would I want to sit there and fight Floyd Mayweather when I could just kick an old lady's cane over? <laughs> it's, it's really, or it's really raw. But right. but seriously, you know, why am I going to sit there and, and be so caught up? That's why when I see guys on Twitter that get super bogged down in the esoteric vol stuff that, you know, some of the things that we do, I'm like, man, you're not running a vol book. You know, if I, if I was and again, full disclaimer, you know, if I was just out there to try to make money like you know, our the thing that we do on the side with, with the side fund, some of the, the majority of it don't does not come from, you know, these dispersion or fall trades. It's just like really simple edges that are out there in the market that I can just take advantage of. And if you're a retail guy with, with a smaller account, you could do that all day long and pad your account all day long. That's why you kind of hear about these stories. Some of it is like nonsense, but you do hear some stories about retail guys turning little amounts of money into, into large sums and consistently doing it for years for years because of the process is correct because the edge is there. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's an ego thing with a lot of these guys who, who don't want to participate in these areas. Also to clarify, like you said, you've seen retail guys like turn into large sums, but it then it's then consistently usually is capacity constrained, but they're still just clipping off a huge coupon. And that's what like people miss. It's like, there's, there's ways like, I mean, it's hard to find, so it's not that easy, but like, there's ways that retail does have an advantage, right? Like we're saying was like, you know, the ego thing with the institutional side. And I think that's what we're both highlighting is like, people have no idea a lot of times that like a lot of institutional trading, you would think it's about your P and L it's black and white. Like, did I make money? Am I the best at this? But no, there's all these other con- constraints and looking good and all that other stuff that like affect the institutional traders. But you're saying, retail can without those constraints can have really interesting trades they also can have different time horizons and then they can they can play in these capacity constrained spaces where yeah you might um you know build a small you know uh you know nest egg or or bankroll up to like 10 million bucks and you're like capacity is constrained 10 billion bucks but you're making you have 10 million bucks that's clipping off five million dollars a year in returns that's a great living but that's that's what's out there yeah yeah our our part my partner will you know he's a big He's a big example of this. And this is the reason why when we were putting together Amber's, I was so excited to work directly with Will. You know, Sal, Sal's ex-Citadel, ex-Morgan Stanley, so we'll exclude him. And obviously, I, I have, you know, a background from the institutional side as well. But Will has just been a pure independent trader. And this is somebody that I definitely wanted to be on my team 
because of the ability to think that way, to think about, okay, I know and I understand how to make seven figures a year cons- consistently, right? So I know how to, how to do that. Low seven figures, right? You're not going to, because some of these strategies are capacity constraint, but as a trader, which an independent trader, which, you know, he was, he came to the table every day, understood edges, understood dislocations and made that amount of money to support him and his family every single day consistently. But if you're on the institutional side, you'll get that guy who, when a dislocation occurs or when things go wrong, they don't have that same trader psyche. So they'll be sitting there showing you, this is what the data says, follow the data, follow the data, right? And and what we were talking about, this is where the relative value spreads are breaking and things are going haywire. And he's telling me, mean revert this strategy, right? And we're having a, a disagreement about this because conceptually he doesn't understand the core root of, of edges and dislocations and and real trading what it's like to be out there but a guy like will who puts it on the line every day and understands these dislocations will say i'm not getting in front of this this rv break because this could be some guy in asia that's just completely blowing through the line you know so this mentality is what i think what i know makes good managers and good traders and that's why you know we internally we have that nice mix I, i like to believe that we have that nice mix because it's not just some quant who's sitting there and just reading off numbers. It's like we know and we understand the process, how to generate alpha, how to manage risk, how to think about portfolio construction and to merge all these things in to be to go out there and, and trade, not just think in this uniform manner that if the data says this, just just do that. And that's it. And it, that's the end all be all, which, which you'll get with most you know, probably, probably definitely over 50% of the institutional guys. That's why you hear about some of these large blowups and you look at him and you're like, well, why were you nakedly shorting, uh, you know, a, a low float, small cap stock? Um, and are you surprised that you blew up on that? Well, of course, you know, like, of, of course that was going to happen. You didn't think that, that, that could go up 300, 400%. Why? It's, you know, there's the outstanding shares are like, you know, 7 million outstanding shares. And then, you know, people are upset that they lost their money. But it's like the manager didn't come from that background to, to generate alpha. He came from the background where I got to wear the suit. I got to wear the tie. I'll come in the office at this time. Right. And he's worked his way up the corporate ladder well enough to now go and manage a fund. But what's on paper, which looks all polished and clean, is not truly representative as to the trader that the person is. Wait, but in, in fairness, they're smarter than we are because we should have been short ball guys, right? Because you just blow up a short ball book, you call it a black swan event, everybody lost, and then you just spin up a new fund and you just keep doing that over and over again, right? Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. So, so yeah, we're the idiots in this scenario. So um, I'm not sure how much we can get into this in the podcast, but it was one thing you and I haven't spent much time talking about. So I want to dig into the the VXX, like Barclays issue. Uh, with with the ETN, and it looks like, and at the end of the day, it was more of a, a legal snafu than anything else. But um, and obviously, we can't talk numbers. But you guys were on the right side of that trade. You had an, uh, a very nice expansion in PNL during that period. But um, I'm curious, like in hindsight, you know, after that trade doesn't keep expanding, you know, everybody's going to come back to you and be like, "Why didn't you monetize it?" And like to me, it's like that's not your position. You're swinging for the fences in that scenario, and so that's what I want you to do. But at the same time. I know traders in the um, that are you know well known hedge fund guys that during the uh, Volmageddon of February 2018 they were the ones calling for that to happen and then it kind of you know they they were looking for it to extend and expand and they got caught in the mean reversion side of that too and and they didn't have great P and Ls because it didn't expand the way they want to so I'm just curious like how you guys talked about that internally or how you thought about that trade as you started to get some really outsized, you know, expansion of your P and L from it. Did you think about, you know, at least tranching out some of that and, and, and banking some of that profit or were you there like, no, this is where we can make really outsized returns where a lot of people in hindsight where hindsight's 2020, they'd be like, Oh man, I wish you would have booked that. Cause then it would have been a positive P and L for the year. And you could have just, you know, went on vacation. Oh yeah. I, I do that. I, I would do that every single time. I would do that. The, the exact way that we acted, I would act, if you give me a, a million scenarios, I would act the same way in a million scenarios because this has played out a million times to me. I've seen this literally a million times. It may not be in the same name, in the same profile and everything, but when you're thinking about a monetization process and your forward forecast, it's all the same. So it goes back to us thinking about what the mandate of the, the, the business is. 
And for us, if we have an investor that is in the business, they're not with us to make 12%. I'll tell you right now, and I'm sure you know you guys are, aren't with us to make 12% too, right? As an investor, you, you're not with us to make 12%. One thing that we did differently when we started this business was we said that we want to we want to bring a product that when the dislocation occurs, we're going to shoot the lights out. It's not 20%. It's not 30%. It's not 50%. We, we want to be plus 2x, 3x, 4x. We, we want to carry that exposure. Now, the, the trade-off to that is, well, if you're going to carry that much exposure in the front of the term structure, you're going to bleed. Um, you know, So you're going to have to do things that are uncorrelated to S&P fall to manage that bleed and make sure that you stay afloat so you're not bleeding out 20, 30% on an annual basis. So the way how we look at it is, well, our, what, what is our job as a, a firm? And are we honoring that mandate? And when we saw the book skip up like that, we looked at the potential distribution as to what could potentially happen. And we said, cool, we could lock in a very tiny amount for the sake of trading. And that's just, this is just trading one-on-one, right? You, you go up on a, on a position, you lock some of it in no matter what. But what are we waiting for um, going forward? And it didn't give us what we were looking for at that moment. So there was no action. And we view that the same way a million times over because one day you will get that move. And then, you know, the same way how, how, and, you know, none of our investors said anything to us about this or were saying, hey, you should have locked in 13% or anything like that. Right. Because again, I think everybody who's with us understands the mandate of the firm. And that's really the core focus because when that day comes, you don't want to be like, here, here's 30%. Because they're going to look at it and be like, well, wait, hold on. Shouldn't you have made 400%? Yeah, but I was aggressively locking it in. You know, like I'd rather, I'd rather give it all back if I'm up, you know, 12, 15, 20% or so based on the understanding that what the investor base is there for is not that. They are there for it outside. And this is, this is the investor's understanding as to what they're putting their money towards too. You know, are you, putting, are you looking for something that is going to return? 12% on those type of dislocate. Are you, are you looking to make 12% when the equity market is down 5%? Well, we're not going to be the product for you. You know, that's just flat out. I tell that to, to potential investors all the time. If you're looking for a product that is going to track the S&P one for one, that's not us. We are a convex. We carry a convex profile that's looking to outperform during those real moments of market stress. So as a trader, I would take that same trade, that same process all day long, because out of one of those uh, coin tosses, it's going to turn up our way. Uh, and when it does turn up our way, that outsized return is going to be enough to cover exponential amount of the times that you know we, we missed in, in not taking that. Years worth. And you don't know if that's the straw that's going to break the camel's back too. Like this is the, this is the dislocation where it starts. And this is where you guys really monetize that PL. And you said that none of your investors said anything to you, but they did say things uh, to me behind your back, but like none of them were, none of them were bad. Like, it's like, you know, you educate people, but it's like, it's always like, but damn, I would have taken that in hindsight, you know, that would have been a nice positive carry for the year, but that's always in hindsight. And they were joking kind of about that, but it actually reminded me of, um, when Soros uh, broke the Bank of England, what people don't know a lot of times that they'd forget is he was up 40% on that year. He had open P&L of positive 40%, and he basically bet like upwards of 40 50%. So he's like, look, if I totally blow this trade up, I'm down 10% on the year. And he was willing to risk that plus 40 open P&L on his year like just to make that huge trade you know, where he netted you know, over a billion dollars. And mm -hmm. it's just interesting. Like you said, you're willing to risk that open P&L to have exponential returns. That, yeah, that's trading. That's that's trading one on one. You know, um, a part of that is monetizing in tiers, right? So I'm the first. I'm the first one to complain and be like, "You got to monetize. You got to monetize." But you don't want to monetize too early in the move, to a point where you're cutting off the potential convexity. And that's something that we just was not going to do. So yeah, sure, we monetize a smidgen of it, but. That wasn't the the area to monetize the the bulk of the move, one third of the move, or one half. You know, you're up, and this is just the way how I guess we look at it. You're up fifty plus percent, sure. Lock in a third, like you know, those are one of those situations where, you know, you lock in a third, and and you say, okay, 
you know, where are we comfortable with locking in the other third lot? Or, and then where are we comfortable locking in the final third lot? And, and you know, where are we comfortable getting out the entirety of the trade if it goes against us? But it didn't move to that fashion to, to make us interested. Um, and, you know, I've seen, like I said, I've seen this a million times. <laughs> it's like I've seen throughout throughout my, my career trading, I've seen this a million times. It's not the first time you saw a dislocation that, that had some sort of a anomaly event. And it's the same process that, that works over the course of a full market cycle. You know, when you let those outsized winners take way, uh, it, it really it really does uh, amazing things for the overall portfolio. Perfect. And it's uh, it's been a long trading day, so I appreciate you getting on to record a podcast. So I'll, I'll, my, I'm going to say my hardest question as my final question, because I'm sure like after you leave here, you're going to go get a workout in. And, and this holds for me. This is like the conundrum I'm always dealing with is like, no matter how much we work out and monetize all of our genetic gifts, how does it feel that you'll never be as handsome as Corey Hofstein? Man, that guy's that guy is pretty hot. I will say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I listen to this. <laughs> Just cracking up right now. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Hofstein, I, I, he is the Adonis of finance for sure. If you guys are listening to this, I'm sure anybody, everybody listens to this knows Corey Hofstein. But if you have not, if you do not know Corey Hofstein, just Google him and you will see a Calvin Klein model. <laughs> but he is actually a quant nerd in, in the finance realm. Um, but yeah, Hofstein's a pretty good-looking dude, man. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I think he grew up an ugly duckling, and then he's made his way into these runway model good looks. And so, like you said, like obviously his podcast is phenomenal, and you are amazing on his podcast. And then, just for context, you know, I think Corey's six foot four. I'm five nine, and you're like five five. So, like that's don't why. Don't listen. <laughs> I'm not five five. Do not listen to this man. <laughs> if they if they Google images of you online, you look like Prince leaning up against the wall. Like you got your yeah. your high heel boots on, and you're you're really stretching for that five six, like Bruno Mars style. If you guys look up, the, Bloomberg did this uh, this article on me. Uh, if you guys look up the article and you see that picture, I look really short. I assure you, I'm not that short in real life. I'm not tiny like what that picture assumes but yes standing next to Hofstein would probably make me look really really short like I'm five seven or, or five six or so what do you claim <laughs> this guy what do you claim <laughs> no, no what do you what what height do you claim because I've been with you in real life what do you claim <laughs> yeah I mean dude I, I I claim what is on the driver's license this is five ten all right I'll give you that I think you're stretching you're probably like me like five nine and a half and you round it up oh man oh man <laughs> That's the uh, perfect place for Ender, man. Thanks for coming on. I look forward to doing this again in the future. Absolutely, brother. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate if you would share this show with friends and leave us a review on iTunes as it helps more listeners find the show and join our amazing community. To those of you who already shared or left a review, thank you very sincerely. It does mean a lot to us. If you'd like more information about Mutiny Fund, you can go to mutinyfund.com. For any thoughts on how we can improve the show or questions about anything we've talked about here on the podcast today, drop us a message via email. I'm taylor at mutinyfund.com and Jason is jason at mutinyfund.com. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at Taylor Pearson M-E and Jason is at Jason Mutiny. To hear about new episodes or get our monthly newsletter with reading recommendations, sign up at mutinyfund.com slash newsletter. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Mutiny Fund, their affiliates or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants of this podcast are instructed to not make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. Listeners are reminded that managed features, commodity trading, forex trading and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors and you should not rely on any of the information as a substitute for the exercise of your own skill and judgment in making a decision on the appropriateness of such investments. Visit mutinyfund.com slash disclaimer for more information.